Sometime in the future, in the next few billion years, our sun is going to start evolving into what's called a red giant. It's going to expand to a very, very large distance. And then at some point, it's going to contract and become what's called a white dwarf. It's going to become very, very small and it's going to have only carbon and oxygen on the inside. Its size is going to be very close to the size of Earth, but its density is going to be much larger. Now, the, all of this is related to something called Chandrasekhar limit, and this is the topic we'll be talking about today and discuss the person that actually discovered all of this. Welcome to What the Math and enjoy the video. And let's actually start by talking about the evolution of stars. So I'm going to start with Sirius B because that's probably the most famous white dwarf um, relatively close to us. And so Sirius B um, is currently the mass of about 0.97 mass of sun or 97% and 98% of the mass of sun. And uh, if you look at the size comparison here, this is what it actually looks like. So this is our sun next to Sirius B. They're obviously very different in size. And Sirius B is really, um, in terms of sizes, it's very close to the size of our planet Earth. So if I place Earth next to it, this is basically almost exactly the same size. But obviously this is a lot more dense. And so it's, it's an object that's very, very dense and uh, relatively massive as well. Now, Sirius B used to be very similar to our sun, possibly a little bit more massive, actually. It was very likely to have been very similar to what a star known as Betelgeuse is now. So Betelgeuse is a red giant and it's very likely that it's going to eventually become very sim similar to what Sirius B is. Now, how did that happen? Well, at some point Betelgeuse will lose all of its outer layer and what will be left on the inside is going to compa compact itself into this massive and very dense object. This will happen in a few million, possibly uh, a billion years. And this is essentially what most of the stars that have a mass um, less than about eight masses of or nine masses of sun will uh, become basically. So if a star is not very massive, after it lives off its um, life, it basically can become three different things. It can either become a white dwarf or if it's a little bit more massive, like for example, if it's uh, same mass as this star right here, Antares, it may become something different. It may also become a neutron star. And if it's even more massive, if it's, for example, similar to Deneb, which is about 19 masses of sun, it will become a black hole. So there's three possibilities for stars in the future. Now, most of the stars will actually become this. Most of the stars will become white dwarfs, including our sun. And some stars will obviously become neutron stars, and neutron stars, if I were to place one right here, it's actually even uh, even more massive, but even smaller in size. It's, it's about size of, uh, well, it's 13 kilometers in radius, so that's about size of New York, I guess. Um, and so it, it's basically a very, very dense, but very massive object. And so the question is basically this. So what determines if the star becomes a white dwarf or a neutron star and this is essentially where the so-called Chandrasekhar limit comes into play. What Chandrasekhar limit refers to is the mass necessary for a star to essentially turn from a white dwarf into something else, usually a neutron star or a black hole. And this mass is exactly 1.39 masses of sun. So currently this is about 0.97 masses of sun. If I were to start increasing the mass of Sirius, at some point, this white dwarf is not going to be a white dwarf anymore. It's actually going to go supernova. So right around, if I press this button one more time, it's going to go supernova because it will have reached its Chandrasekhar limit. Now, what is that limit? What does it refer to? So let me just try to explain it to you uh, by putting some pictures here. So inside of this star right, right now, there's actually two forces that are sort of fighting each other. There's a force of gravity, which is pushing inwards. And there is a force of what's called electron degeneracy pressure, which is basically pushing outwards and preventing the gravity from making the star collapse. Now, electric degeneracy pressure results from the fact that um, if you place things too close together, electrons will start re repulsing each other because 
According to various laws of physics, uh, two electrons can never really be in the same place with the same amount of energy. So because of this, they start repelling each other and create a sort of outwards force. But when a star becomes more massive and when uh, the gravity sort of becomes more powerful than the force of um, electric degeneracy pressure, um, star will essentially explode. And this happens because the star is no longer balanced on the inside and it just goes into a very, very um, active nuclear reaction and becomes a supernova. This is actually called a type 1a supernova that is uh, something I discussed in the previous video as well. And this supernova occurs when a white dwarf uh, consumes or acquires mass from the outside and essentially uh, becomes unstable. But this type of a supernova only occurs in stars that have already become white dwarfs. But some stars, like for example um, Antares here, will not really become white dwarfs. As a matter of fact, they'll become something else. Or their original mass, wh when it starts collapsing, is going to actually be above uh, Chandrasekhar limit. So it's going to be above 1.39 masses of sun. And this is what is going to happen to them. So this particular star, after it becomes... Um, after it goes in, through its nova stage and after it basically loses its, its outer shell is going to become a much much smaller object known as a neutron star now this is a little bit different from what the other neutron star looked like but this is essentially a neutron star it's uh, 1.5 masses of sun and it's 12 kilometers in radius now neutron stars are pretty cool because essentially they're very similar to white dwarfs in the way they uh, they are created they are stars that have an outside gravity force uh, acting on them but from the inside they have a different type of a force acting and preventing the collapse these types of forces are known as neutron degeneracy pressure because now inside of the star electrons and protons combine into neutrons and prevent each other from basically collapsing even further so that's essentially how neutron stars form and how they're created and if this original star is even more massive if it's essentially similar to Deneb right here they will have so much mass um, originally that uh, at some point there will be nothing stopping them from collapsing even further and this is essentially when the black holes are created. This is how black, uh, black holes are formed and this is uh, what a lot of stars that are very very massive will become. So there are basically three future possibilities for most of the stars. But because this video uh, is called Chandrasekhar limit, I just wanted to actually uh, explain more about it and basically give you the idea of who discovered it and why it has such an interesting and such a strange name. And so Chandrasekhar limit is actually named after a very very famous um, Indian mathematician Subramanian Chandrasekhar. Now, this particular person may not be as famous as Einstein, but he really should be because when he was only 19 years old, he essentially was able to use calculus and mathematics to discover that there is essentially this limit for white dwarf stars that will prevent them from collapsing further. And he called that uh, just, he called it a limit, but because of his discovery and because of his age, it was, it was later named after him. And so now it's known as Chandrasekhar limit. But I guess the important part here is that um, back then, uh, nobody really believed him at first. And as a matter of fact, there was a, a famous uh, British mathematician by the name of Arthur Eddington, who essentially uh, opposed this uh, this finding and uh, basically said it was impossible to have this absurd finding and that it, it, this was essentially indicate that there was something called black holes and he definitely did not believe in black holes as did most of the scientists back then. So, so unfortunately for Chandrasekhar, not many people supported him back then and he essentially was left all alone with, with his theories and uh, despite all of all of this, he actually continued to study this particular limit and then um, st continued to study things like black holes and gravitational um, waves as well because um, just like Einstein, he basically opposed the majority or the establishment um, thinking and decided to focus on what he believed was true. And for such a young person to essentially oppose many physicists, uh, w th this was actually pretty difficult for him. Nevertheless, though, he actually got invited to study in, um, in, in Britain and he then was able to even get a really um, prestigious position in University of Chicago. But the reason why Chandrasekhar is not as famous as Einstein is really because of uh, Eddington and because of his British um, uh, friends, I guess, British physicists that essentially try to cover up all of these findings and uh, refused to consider the idea that stars might collapse to nothing and um, this of course meant that 
they refused the idea of black holes that were discovered a few years after that. But I think in modern ast astronomy and astrophysics, most people would agree that Chandrasekhar would be just as influential as Einstein, because this particular limit of 1.39 masses of Sun is essentially what makes um, or what helps us understand things like neutron stars and things like black holes. And without his finding, we might not even have been able to discover some of the black holes we found later. And what's even more interesting is that uh, all of his findings were essentially uh, discovered uh, during his trip from India to England in 1930. So on the way to England, specifically on the train, he started doing these calculations by hand, without any computers, without any calculators, um, where he essentially used uh, various formulas, especially uh, the degenerate Fermi, Fermi gas formula, to try to calculate um, what makes white dwarfs stable and what really um, happens to stars after they go through the cycle and after they lose their outer shell and somehow he was able to discover uh, several actually I believe 20 different uh, calculus formulas that show them that there was this limit that he uh, then decided to publish in one of his papers and I think his story is actually very inspirational because despite him being from um, a very sort of a minority thinking group and despite him not even being um, a a person of British descent or specifically a white physicist which were dominating the field back then, he was actually able to argue his point and to show everyone that not only was he, that he was right essentially, but that the other people, the other very well established and very powerful astrophysicists were actually completely wrong. And for this I actually really admire him and uh, I hope that his story may even serve as an inspiration to future physicists because it was really people like him that essentially changed our understanding of the universe and it was really thanks to him that we now know about all of these other objects like neutron stars, black holes and even uh, potentially something called quark stars which about which we'll talk in one of the future videos. Anyway, so that's really all I wanted to talk about in this particular video and the story that I wanted to talk to you about is of course about Subrahmanyan Chandra Zakhar. Now his name will hopefully live in history as one of the most amazing astrophysicists in our uh, or in previous century but it was also in our lifetime because he um, he actually died um, in 95 at the age of 84 and he was um, a very well established professor of astrophysics in the University of Chicago. And so maybe one day you, the person who is watching this video right now, will also be able to discover something absolutely incredible. And even if everyone else is saying that you're wrong, but the mathematics behind it is actually correct, maybe you should keep arguing your points and prove them wrong. Anyway, thank you so much for watching. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and hopefully you will subscribe, like and share this video with your friends. I will see you guys in the next video. Give me later and as always, bye bye.